Hey friends, I'm Mark Allen Shelsky, and this is The Apprenticeship Way, a podcast about spiritual growth following the way of Jesus. This is episode 49. Church, stop acting like a hot topic, or maybe a better title, building a church people actually want to go to. Today's podcast is made possible by my summer inflation sale. You heard me. Life has gotten expensive, hasn't it? Gas, groceries, it's all a bit much. Now, Christina, my wife, is a teacher, and so the normal gig is that our family is without a second paycheck for a couple of months every summer. In past years, we've budgeted to cover that, but this year, the dramatic increase of prices of essential things has just outpaced our budget. So I'm looking for some extra income. So if you've ever thought about buying something I make, now is an excellent time. So what could you get? any and all of my books, my online courses, and of course, for some people, there's the work that I do to support writers. See it all with special summer inflation sale prices at www.markallenshelsky.com forward slash summer inflation sale. Those prices will be available until August 1st. So act fast, I've got some bills to pay. I grew up in Ohio, the American Midwest, in the 1980s, and in that place and time, everyone went to church, everyone I knew. The only question was, how into it were you? But everyone went to church. Fast forward through two recessions, maybe three now, the 9-11 attacks, a pointless 20-year war, a housing bubble or two, a global pandemic that shut down in-person gatherings for, in some cases, a year or more and the world has changed. The assumption that everyone goes to church is just no longer true, especially where I live here in the Pacific Northwest. Brian Berg wrote a book called The Nuns about that category of people who identify themselves as spiritual but not religious. In an article he wrote, looking at the most recent data from the General Social Survey, he pointed out that in a 30-year time period, the share of baby boomers who believe in God dropped 3%. In that same time period, but the last 20 years, the share of millennials who believe in God dropped 10%. And in that same period of time, just the last five years, the share of Gen Z who believe in God has dropped 18%. 18%. In that same time period, every single cohort has shown a significant increase in people who don't attend church and don't consider themselves affiliated with any religion at all. In concluding his analysis, Berg wrote, I think it's entirely fair to say that Generation X, my generation, represents the last generation raised with traditional American religion. He's saying that everyone younger than me is experiencing a different culture and expectation when it comes to church than what was considered normal by people my age and older. The question of church is one a lot of people are wrestling with right now, especially after the pandemic sort of broke the habit of church attendance for a lot of people. People are wondering if church even matters to them. Does church contribute anything worthwhile to the world? You might jump in and say, yes, but then that probably means you're one of the deep insiders. Consider the question from the outside. Apart from religious obligation, why would anyone make the commitment to be part of this kind of community? But today we're going to dig into those questions. I'll be chatting with Kevin Makins. He wrote a book called, Why Would Anyone Go to Church? More importantly, he's wrestled with this in a real community with real people. He's a founding pastor of Eucharist Church in downtown Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. This is a guy who has spent a lot of time thinking about this very question. And so I started by asking Kevin why he thinks so many people right now just aren't interested in church at all. It's probably in part because church just isn't that interesting anymore. (laughs) Oh. (laughs) <laughs> Sorry, church. Not that it's not. It is. If if you believe unto the Lord Jesus Christ, it's quite an amazing place. However, um, if you haven't had a lived encounter with the sort of transcendence that church is pointing to, if you haven't walked the way, the, the good road of Christ long enough to see how it works and what it produces in and of its own way, then mm-hmm. church just to you looks like the strangest social club for people that have nothing better to do or, you know, are just struggling with guilt over their dead grandma who prayed for them every day. You know, there was a time where I imagine church was good, <laughs> like in air quotes, good. You know, like there was a time where there just wasn't that much entertainment. 
Mm. You know, it's like 1750 and you're a cobbler and you cobble shoes and your father cobbled shoes and you're, you know, maybe there's one wedding a year where people get together and celebrate, but what do you got going on? One person in town has a lute and occasionally they play a song. There's not much going on, but on Sunday, on Sabbath, the whole town shuts down. Everyone gets together at the four or five buildings nearby. There's music, there's singing, there's hymns, there's a sense of transcendence, belonging, connection. You know, your whole life is wrapped up in a singular moment where everyone you know looks to something beyond them, beyond the economy, Mm -hmm. beyond what they're doing that week, their stresses, their worries. Very intelligent, well-read people are bringing these these intellectual philosophical questions. Very simple people are bringing their, their daily concerns and their daily needs. And everyone gets together and looks at something beyond them, it's not only the like kind of height of the collective psyche of that town, it's also the only thing that's going on. Church, it's amazing 300 years ago. <laughs> right, right. So it seems like there's <laughs> two things in that description that are going on that we have to contend with. One is that for a long time, and it's not just 300 years, it's the last, you know, probably 1300 years or 1400 years, church was the cultural center of the community. Mm-hmm. And that is no longer true. Mm-hmm. And then the second thing is that in some way, church is associated with a transcendent experience. And Mm -hmm. that doesn't feel true now for many people. Yes, absolutely. And, and, you know, I'd see it fitting in with broader themes of uh, the secularization of the West. Not just that people don't believe in the Christian God, but we don't even know if we believe in a God. Um, And if we do believe in a God, he's not a transcendent God or they're not a transcendent God. It's a kind of hobbyist God. So, you know, yoga, I, I do yoga, but if I fall out of yoga... The God of yoga is not going to come and, and wake me up in the night with a haunting message of transcendence. Right, right. So yeah, these, there's, no, these there's are, no attached judgment. No, so the, you know, which, which I understand because also at the same time as what we're talking about, the church got a little too powerful for her own bridges and started to make a lot of strong declarations about what God was saying and who God was that weren't mm. necessarily about God at all. They were about Christendom, the power of Christianity the church, the institution, the pastor, the voice. Mm -hmm, So, mm -hmm. you know, I understand why people buck and push away at that idea of a transcendent God. You know, I totally understand that because, well, the church has often said that transcendent God is a mouthpiece and he sounds just like me, your white middle-aged, you know, Baptist pastor. And so I understand why people push against that. Makes perfect sense. But we haven't yet known what to put in its place. And so we have these little buffet style religions where we'll pick up things that we find interesting, transcendent, meaningful, but they don't give shape to our life. There's something that we pick up and we put down as we desire. And that's very Mm -hmm. different from a transcendent force, God, um, who picks you up Mm -hmm. when you are down. Um, and so that direction of things, you know, if you're an AA, you've probably encountered the transcendent God or this transcendent reality, whatever language people put to it. But if you haven't experienced that transcendence, you haven't experienced that sense that there is something beyond you, greater than you. If you haven't put that to the test to some degree or relied on it, if you have the privilege to buffer yourself from the suffering of life, if you have the privilege to Mm -hmm. have insurance, to have food on the table, to have Netflix subscription on your phone whenever you want it. If you have all that, you may have never needed to encounter that transcendent God. This kind of rise of secularism has also come with a rise of wealth. You know, not that we're um, rich right now. We have a lot of wealth inequality, but our basic needs are provided for. Our Mm -hmm. lives are sort of safe. The air in our houses is usually conditioned, you know, Mm -hmm. so we've been guarded from some of what might have naturally led other generations towards spirituality. So there's there's sort of what does church mean to me as an individual who perhaps has encountered a sense of transcendence. But then there's also the question of what does church mean to us at a cultural or a sociological collective psyche level? Yeah. For us, church used to be this, uh, not in all places and at all times, of course, there's a lot of colonization, other factors. So, you know, d- don't take this too far. But I think We could probably say that in many settings, if not most settings, church was also a place of collective unity where we set aside our little tribal identities, you know, whether we were rich or poor, whether we were, um, you know, people who were of different levels of class, had different beliefs in terms of the the, uh, 
intellectual beliefs that we might carry, stuff like that. But we'd all go to church and we'd all sort of surrender to one thing. And so what used to function as a gathering point for diverse people has also become in our culture and in our cultural understanding, a tribal space for a particular group of religious people who are de facto in opposition to other people. Mm. And so I think those, those two sort of um, realities intertwined, the lack of personal transcendence and the fact that it has become now not a collective place of unity, but a tribal place of, uh, of, of disunity or of loyalty to, to your religious cause. I think those two right. things make church very unappealing for someone looking in from the outside who's trying to figure out how to be a human in 2021. Boy, that last part there, that question that they're asking feels really helpful to me. If this outside person is looking at the church and saying, how does this group or belief system or community help me be a human? They're not getting clear answers. They're seeing this is a group that actually some of them spend a lot of time denying what it means to be human. They're not <laughs> going to talk about emotions. They're not trauma aware. They're not they're not going to talk about, you know, struggles with mental health. So that's not helpful. Some of these groups are centering a particular very narrow kind of humanity. Mm -hmm. And you can tell whether it's on the, you know, on the billboard or not, that this church is only for this kind of person, this group mm -hmm. of people, this political persuasion. And I don't want to be a part of that. They're also saying, hey, I have this intuitive sense of compassion to people around me. There are people that are hurting, and this group of people is contributing to that hurt or excluding people. And so that person that's saying, how do you help me be human, is looking at the church and not seeing a helpful answer. No, and I mean, I don't even know where we begin on that one. Because mm -hmm. the truth is that a lot of what we're describing is not necessarily a reflection of the historic Christian church or the historic Christian faith. But we have this sort of elephant in the room, or maybe a donkey in the room. I don't even know all your metaphors uh, down <laughs> right, there in the, the south. Bo both of those. The, both I think of those, it's a bit the of both. And the donkeys. That America, I say this as a, as a Canadian, you know, love you all, um, but you make a lot of noise. We all watch your shows, and we've you've exported your media around the world. So there's a sort of hijacking of the collective imagination at a larger scale, both in America and even beyond, yeah. around the stories we tell ourselves about church and religion. Mm -hmm. And those stories are in part reflecting a truthful reality. As you said, there is loyalty, tribalism, nationalism, white supremacy that has snuck into, in particular, the evangelical church in America. The problem is then, though, that also people that don't know that much about church go, evangelical church in America, that must be every Christian. Right, that exactly. that must be... Right what Christianity teaches. Right. And it actually just might be a 200 year heresy. Yeah. And if not heresy, it might be a 200 year um, misstep. Mm -hmm. You know, looking at church history, we find a lot of couple hundred year missteps. That's part of the evolution of the spiritual life of the church, you know, but when we're in it and we are so ill-equipped to know our own story for those of us who are part of the church. And when those who aren't a part of the church haven't been given a place to hear the story, and we're used to quick sound bites. Well, so what are we going to get fed? We're going to get fed the worst stories about the church. Now, I think that the church is in a moment of reckoning, a well overdue moment of reckoning, because so much of our theology, our structures comes with this colonialist mindset, especially in North America and Turtle Island, where we started our experiment here using religious language and violence and uh, and oppression against indigenous people. So yeah. this is a necessary reckoning for us. We shouldn't be crying out that we're oppressed. But also, it's not the whole story. We need to look right. to the global church. We need to look to the right. story of the Christian faith um, in the Orthodox tradition, you know, in the healthy expressions within the Catholic tradition, the healthy examples of Protestant churches. In every city where there's a billboard by some very, you know, ignorant big brother church of ours that's going, come to our church, get this, vote for this person. For every one of those, I bet there's 10 people faithfully loving their neighbors or 10 congregations in an inner right. city faithfully serving. But I think part mm. of what we have to do as we tell the story is try to see the story clearly mm. enough that yeah. we who are followers of the way don't get spun by the spin of anger and, uh, and, and bitterness Right. But also at the same time, we need to read the times and say, this is the church's judgment for her sin of white mm -hmm. supremacy and nationalism and getting into bed with the powers. Both yes. those things yes. can be true at the same time. And I think the rebirthing of the church that we're experiencing 
as sort of all the field starts to die off here in Canada, you know, the field is, is fallow. We're gathering the seeds from what had been grown here. You know, we're losing uh, more than a third of our church buildings will be closed in the next five or seven years. If we can gather the seeds and say, what was the spirit of God doing in this mess? Mm -hmm. I think that gives us a good opportunity to plant the future of the church that is going to uh, hopefully reflect much more clearly and beautifully the gospel, the good news, the good road that we're trying to witness to. Hmm. It seems like when I look at the church landscape that there's sort of two umbrella responses that churches are making. Some churches are seeing uh, everything you've described, and their response is sort of these changes in culture we have to stand against. We have to resist these things. We have to use our influence and our resources to hold on to the culture that is slipping away from us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then there's another group that is saying, look, culture is what it is. The cultural changes have happened. We have to figure out how to be the church in new ways in the culture we find ourselves in. And holding on to some of our culturally determined responses from the past are going to get in the way of our mission being the people of God. Right, So sort of two kind of responses. Can we, on the one hand, can we bring back, hold on, conserve the culture that feels like it's slipping out of our grasp? Or is that out of our control and we need to adapt, adopt, and improve? I think those are two of the responses that we're seeing, the two predominant responses. I might even say of that second response, there is a group that says we need to stop this change from happening, mm -hmm. as you said, that first group, by using force. And there's a second group of us uh, who are more likely to say, we need to improve, pivot, do things with our force to make things better. Mm -hmm. And I think that both of those are ways of being the church that have blind spots. Mm -hmm. uh, and the blind spot is that they both include us doing things. I'm really starting to wonder if perhaps our goal isn't to do a bit less and to say what is happening in the culture around us and how do I not fight that with all my might as if this is a culture war, but also how do I not try to make that culture happy and run really hard and work really hard to look like I'm the church that's keeping up with the times? Mm -hmm. Because, mm -hmm. you know, I look around at the times we're in, it's not like people are particularly happy, Mark. Yeah, They're not all having a great, you know, the times we're in are making people miserable too. Yeah. And so, yes, you know, I'm all for uh, queer belonging in the church, 100%. I'm all for... Uh, talking about critical race theory and reckoning with the sins of the past. You know, so if people are calling those cultural changes, I would say, oh, well, those are cultural changes that seem to be in many ways fruitful. But if I run out and start trying to do a bunch of things, I'm actually just as likely to get things wrong from the opposite side I used to get things wrong from. So, so there's a certain amount of attentiveness, I think, that is called for uh, life on the vine, you know, and abiding in Christ that says... How do we pay attention to what the Spirit's doing and come alongside what the Spirit is naturally doing hmm. without trying to then pick up our kind of uh, our power and then say, good, thanks for leading us here, God. We've got it from here. Yeah, yeah, right. Because I think that is such a temptation for all of us. I'm preaching to myself here. I love doing stuff, you know, but it, is, it just doesn't seem to be fruitful. When you surface the word power as being sort of a, a troubling word in either kind of response we might have, it, it leads me to think back to where we started in the conversation about why people are not finding church helpful or meaningful. I'm wondering if one of the significant reasons is the many, many poor ways the church has handled power. When you think about all the different modes of power, whether it's influence in society or whether it's that we own a lot of property and real estate and take up space in the community and ask to not be taxed on top of that, um, mm -hmm. or whether it's um, you know influence through the media, uh, whether it's the connection of religious figures getting connected to political figures and lobbying for political solutions to things, those are all misuses of power. Mm -hmm. And... And so then I look at that questioning person who's observing the church from the outside is part of the reason why they're saying, I don't want to be a part of this group because the power dynamic feels unsafe. I absolutely am sure that part of why people don't want to be a part of the church is because look at the history of how this institutions use power. I get that. And I'll also say at the same time, I also don't know an institution that hasn't gotten into bed a bit with power. 
I expect better from the church because we know the story. We know the Christ story. We have no excuse. And at the same time, I expect corruption in the church because there's sinners in the church, just like there's sinners in the banks and there's sinners in uh, the local politicians and the national politicians, you know? So I don't want to be so naive as to say I can only participate in something that's pure. And I think that that's something I'm noticing among um, my generation and in myself, self-confession, mm. you know, mm. I, I, I want to say, well, I'm a Christian, but I'm not that kind of Christian because <laughs> right. I want to be pure. You know, when I went to youth group, oh, sexual purity, that was this thing. Cause that's right. how you got status in that setting was that you, yep. you followed the rules perfectly. Thankfully we're coming to a bit of a reckoning on the ways that we've used that kind of language, but we have not yet dealt with our desire to be pure ethically. Mm -hmm. Um, that we want to be associated with no one who's less than us. You know, if you're pro-vaccination, you don't want to be associated with anyone who's an Mm anti-vaxxer. If you are uh, a liberal in America, you certainly would not want to even be associated with a conservative, never mind at church, in your own family. And I Mm -hmm. understand, like, I really get why people feel this way. Like, and I just can't shake the feeling that one of the best things about church is that it, it, it is that you're stuck with losers. And you're one of them. <laughs> right. right. And if, maybe, we're doing, if we're doing it right, yes. Yeah, like maybe this is the only place where you're going to run into these people that you wouldn't choose. And, and I feel that that is inversely sort of the jujitsu move using this impulse for purity against itself is the gospel saying, yeah, of course you don't want to be associated with all these annoying people and you want to be the good kind of Christian. But I mean, what, Mark, what a, what a beautiful thing that the entrance into the way of life that Christ talks about, the way into that is that you have to be associated with people you don't like, and they don't like you. <laughs> if we're going to try to love everyone, like you, people are telling me, I love everyone, BS. No, you, I don't like everyone. I certainly don't love everyone. Yeah. But if I can learn to do it with 150 people to begin, that's a pretty good training ground. And then if I can be associated with a religion... It's going to be full of people I don't like, and I don't get to remove myself from my own purity and my own appearance on social media or in the eyes of my friends. That's a pretty good place to begin loving your enemy. That's really compelling, Kevin. I don't think I've ever thought about it from that perspective, you know, but if we if we start by saying, hey, you know, God is love and being a part of the church is about learning how to live that kind of other centered co-suffering love. If that's what this is really about, and a lot of people will say, "Yeah, that sounds We'd great." Yeah, that sounds great. You know? I want that. Who who doesn't want the whole world to come together? Let's right. sing Imagine. Like, okay, yeah, that's good. But the only way you really know that you're loving someone is when you're interacting with someone that you wouldn't choose to be benevolent toward. Preach. That's how you know that you really love. Jesus said something similar, right? Even if you're, you know, even the tax collectors will do good things for each other. You know, what? how do you know you really love someone? Well, it's your enemy that will tell you. Your enemy is the one who knows if you're loving or not. Also, loving your enemy doesn't mean that you need to be in close proximity with your enemy. You don't need to be close to abusers. If you're a person of color, you do not need to be in a church with people who are acting racistly. So, you know, let's just be clear that this doesn't mean you have to be associated with all these other people all the time, but maybe there's something worthwhile, even if in stepping into a a broader faith tradition that includes those you would disagree with Mm -hmm. very strongly, or even those you would find quite despicable, they may even be false Christians, but um, but people who hold those views may be real followers of the way. And so there's there's some nuance right. there. I hope people are intelligent enough to tease out on their own with their own community and context. Well, but that nuance though is part of it, right? Because the thing mm-hmm. the thing about purity culture is there's no need for nuance. I've got a line. Not. I've got a line. You're on one side of it or the other, and mm-hmm. I can apply that methodology to any belief system or any particular stream in Christian heritage or whatever. And and nuance isn't just saying, oh, all the world is gray. Nuance is saying that love requires me to have empathy for people anywhere in relationship to the line I've drawn, and maybe even to the question of if that line is necessary. And that empathy is where the nuance comes from. And Mm -hmm. so, yes, a church that's built on love that doesn't mean that it's a church where abusers get a free pass. In fact, that is not loving. 
right? Yeah. It requires this nuance to have empathy for everyone in the conversation and to think carefully through what it looks like to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the mm. law of Christ in those many particulars. Bearing yeah. the burden of an abuser is going to look one way, and that's going to be different than bearing the burden of the person who's been abused. And, and our lo each local community is going to have to discern how that is faithfully lived out, which cares, which people are going to, you know, um, okay, even if you say we want to lean towards victims, great. You can have also different groups of victims that overlap, you know, yeah, where right. somebody who's a refugee from another culture and someone who's a sexual minority may not see things eye to eye, even though they have both suffered. This is the, the wisdom of Christ that we need. Every community has to discern this out in its own local context. And even if these congregations are doing a good and faithful job, if I look at a church in the deep South, I'm going to think they're crazy no matter what they believe. The world they inherit is so different from mine. You know, the, the powers that and principalities that have shaped them are so different than mine, and we each are going to have blind spots. And so, you know, really allowing ourselves to relax a bit and say, you know, I'm just as shaped by my culture as anyone else is. How are we going to get through this if we're all shaped by our own cultures? The only way is, as you said, the, the rule of love. These are schools of love where we learn to love those who are just different enough from us that we can be in contact with them. And in that relationship, bridge the gap. That is so interesting to me because if I think about the fact that real love requires me to pay attention to particularities. I parent my two children differently because they're different human beings and they have different needs. Mm -hmm. If I mm -hmm. expand that principle, which we intuitively agree with, we, we get that that makes sense. If I expand that principle, all of a sudden I can see that the sort of franchising of Christian culture across the globe, this sort of um, declaration that the way church looks, the way we articulate theology, the way we do Christianity is what needs to happen everywhere. That a church in Nashville needs to look like a church in Portland. And that that assumption, which has implications for church practice, ecclesiology, applications of theology, even the metaphors that we use to articulate theology, that assumption is maybe on the face of it a denial of the nature of love. Yeah, man, or at least the nature of incarnation. You yeah. know, how do how does how does the spiritual church manifest physically? Mm. I talk about this in my book in a in a much less wordy way than how does it manifest physically, but I talk about it in in one of the chapters about trying to plant a church in this in in the city that I I was born and raised in and love and how it had to grow up like an organic uh seed from the soil and we needed to give it space. We didn't church plant with a big budget not because we didn't have the money, although we didn't have the money. Um, but we also church planted the way that we did simply because we didn't know what it was yet. You know, we yeah. bought a building a couple of years ago, a 126 year old building. And I thought I knew what to do with it. And my congregation graciously said, we don't think we should do anything for at least a year. We don't even know what it is. And as you were talking about earlier, even about um, force and the church saying, well, we either need to stop this cultural thing. Or we need to rush it ahead. No, no, no. Just, just see what it wants to be. And look for the spirit. Yeah, the spiritual church is going to be universal. Loving your enemies, down is the way up, uh, a life that is lived in secret, um, you know, letting things come to you, all these beautiful truths that are in the gospel. These are all going to be a part of the spiritual landscape of every congregation everywhere. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the creeds are probably a good spiritual starting place for a confession uh, as that tries to manifest. But almost everything else is going to be as unique as the place that it is. And that maybe that's a gift. Maybe that's actually necessary. Right. And maybe the thing that scares me most about what we've done with church is this photocopying, reproducing yes. of yes. a particular manifestation of church. And we all know what happens if you photocopy a photocopy or if you photocopy a photocopy of a photocopy. Maybe part of our quest to sort of master church, make it look the same way. Maybe that's actually what's backfiring on us right now, as you were talking about, Mark, that mm -hmm. we, we actually photocopied one vision of the church so many times that it became unappealing. Yeah. It was no longer able to be seen for what it was. You know, maybe there was a, a particular kind of church that worked in a particular kind of context, but now that church is being sent everywhere. And when that's all over the news and that's all over social media and all the bad fruit of that's being revealed and there's no other kinds of visions of church... Uh, maybe it's no surprise that that bad photocopy is going to start falling apart. 
I think about um, how like in our world, you know, sort of globalization and constant access through social mm -hmm. media sort of homogenizes things mm -hmm. in, in a way that at first is really exciting but then at some point starts to feel hollow. There's a, we've got a local uh, sort of pan Asian fast food chain called Panda Express. That's not. I've had a Panda uh, Express. Okay. So it's fine. People yeah, it's like a pe nice photocopy of a photocopy. People love it, <laughs> but it's not anything in particular. Yes. You know, it's not a particular Asian culture's cuisine. It's yes. sort of Asian themes that have sort of been filtered through this corporate lens and offered in, you know, and so you get it and it's fine. It's not great. It's not expensive. It's available. And but what's what's happened is that the particularity of Thai cuisine and and Japanese cuisine and Indian cuisine, the particularity have been filtered out. Mm -hmm. And it's been made very, very sort of what they would probably call accessible as a good thing. But but the uniqueness of the location has been stripped away. And I think that's a part of the struggle the church is facing here in Portland. You know, one of our current biggest things that people are so excited about and proud of is food carts. And what makes the food cart exciting in comparison to a chain restaurant is it's particularity. It's a yep. couple people making one thing they're really good at making and they love making it and they make it the best it can be. And mm -hmm. you, they just made it 30 seconds before you got it, you know, and you eat it. And, and it's so much better than going to the chain restaurant where everything came out of a freezer mm -hmm. pack. It's, it's completely true. You know, in, in Hamilton, a lot of my friends run small businesses, small food stuff. And you know what? If, if, if half the city doesn't like what they're making, they don't care. Right. Because they're making, they're not making it to keep people happy. They're making it because they think it's really good. And those that love it, 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 they love it. You know, it's yeah. the highlight of their week if they get to go out and eat there. And so, you know, you can see how particularity, you, you can't recreate it in any other place. You have to go to it. It's a unique manifestation right. of something true. And that's gorgeous. The only problem is everyone I know that runs a local restaurant is nearly broke and tired all right. the time. Right, right. Yeah, and that raises um, questions because, about because the system. Because the culture, <laughs> yeah, the culture we're in does not want them to do that. You know, it doesn't, right. it doesn't work. It, we're too dehumanizing of a culture. And I'd say the same thing is true with church. Why? Why, why are all of these churches singing the same songs? Yes, right. What the right. hell are you doing? Why are you singing this? They're not even good ones. Yeah. You know, like if you're going to sing all the same songs, make them old or, you know, pick up one or two <laughs> classics. Don't, don't pick up whatever's new this week. Like you're a hot topic. Right. You know, so, but, but now I'm not, I don't mean to, to poo poo on churches. Everyone's just trying their best. But well, I'm gonna let, say let me, something that yeah, yeah, yeah. Let Go me ahead. interrupt. Let me let me interrupt though, because when you yeah. say when you say that, I think we're on to an important question here. Because the issue is, it's easy in a system where the 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 engine of the system is we got another service this week we got to go we have to keep moving forward we have a certain amount of income we need to make to pay our bills and pay our staff let's keep cruising in that system it's easy to take the top 25 songs from CCLI and just drop them into planning center and your musicians get the charts and boom you go Sitting down with your local musicians and saying, let's write a song that speaks to the moment we're in, that talks about what God is doing in this community among these faces, that takes way more time and effort and pain mm -hmm. than pulling number four off the CCLI list and having your, your musicians do a great cover of it. But it's not just the songs. It's sort of the whole model. If, if you're yes. in that large church model, if you're in that kind of setting, just, just sit for 20 minutes and, and ask God, is this okay? Ask your soul, is this okay by me? And just see what you think. And if you're finding that that system is, is fruitful and that system is actually serving and honoring God and creating a, a church that is more and more over time becoming a unique manifestation of the kingdom, then keep going. And if you know, if you know there are things you could do to slightly shift the culture in a different direction, away from becoming more homogenized and towards becoming a unique manifestation, then just take the next step. Yeah. You know, you don't need to do everything. Just take the next step. And then after that happens, take a look and see what you got. For people then who are maybe in smaller congregations or looking to church plant, I would say just then 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 do as little as possible force-wise. Make as few big decisions as possible right away. 
let things grow slowly and organically. It probably means that your three-year plan with the budget dropping 33% every year from the grant, that's done. Yeah. Right. It's just done. Get rid of it. Don't take money from any anyone for the church plant. Don't take any money. If you're going to church plant and you need a salary, raise some money like a missionary. Get people to give to you because they believe in you. But don't let the church take a dime. Let the church grow into what it's meant to be. That might be 15 people in the living room. That might be 1,000 people on a Sunday. I don't know. That's God's business in your place. Just don't decide what it is in advance. You know. So I, I really think we've just got to shift from trying to pay for churches to start to just paying our missionaries to be missionaries hmm. and letting churches become the churches that they're meant to be so that we don't have to try to make them something they're not. Yes, right. So I want to tie some threads together because this this uh, plea that you've made, which is just, I think, so intriguing, countercultural, and, and intuitively feels right to me. I want to tie that back to our starting conversation about hmm. the person who's looking and saying, the, why should I go to church? This isn't this isn't meaningful to me. One of the threads that surfaces for me is this idea of a church being able to be particular to its mm -hmm. location, to where people are at, to what's going on in that neighborhood. If the church was more responsive to that, more open to that, mm -hmm. more people would say, I'm intrigued in that, I'm interested. Let's push into that space. How might Love that it. model of church <clears throat> begin to speak more meaningfully to the folk who are asking the question, should I go to church or not? Yeah. So let me give you uh, my, uh, another uh, metaphor here that I think will speak to your Portland heart. Coffee shops. You know, we've always had Tim Hortons in our neighborhoods, which is this very like affordable, cheap kind of coffee shop chain. The people that love it, love it. Then there was Starbucks. You know, they come into town, people go, ooh, Starbucks, it's exciting. And there's a lot of energy and hype around Starbucks. People were lining up in the early days. But then you just start realizing, yeah, Starbucks isn't actually unique at all. Every one of their sites looks the same. All their Christmas decor looks like it's been a photocopy of a photocopy. It feels produced, too mm -hmm. produced. Yeah. And then you've got the, the neighborhood coffee shop. In yeah. Hamilton, there's a spot called the Canon. I mentioned it in my book a bunch because it was my friend. My friend started it, a woman from our church, actually, when we were starting the church around the same time. And and our church and this coffee shop paralleled so beautifully because we were both broke and scrappy and, you know, started with what we had. You know, when they opened, they had like a pew from the church building that they had painted and, you know, the floors were beat up. Not everyone went, right. but everyone appreciated that it was there because it was a genuine reflection of that neighborhood. And so I suspect if the church is going to see itself uh, through that metaphoric lens, we should be asking what kind of coffee shop are we called to become? And are we able to be clear about that? If we're going to make a church that is going to be able to speak in a secular post-Christian culture, it's going to need to be one that the people that go to church don't just go to church, but they are the church. It's about more than just the coffee. Yeah. Um, and that those who don't go to that church are really glad it's in the neighborhood because it makes the neighborhood better for everybody. I recorded this interview with Kevin almost nine months ago, and the troubles that he and I talked about have only gotten worse. Political polarization and the way that Christian nationalism has become an explicit part of many Christian conversations and even churches has pushed even more people out of desiring to be part of church. There's a real tension right now about whether Christianity in America will double down on power and control at any cost or whether we will set that temptation down in favor of the humble, other-centered, co-suffering path of Jesus. And the outcome, at least for the next few years, is by no means certain. So the question of why church matters, what it looks like, is even more crucial. As I listened back to our conversation, I gathered together some of our ideas and insights into a picture of what a future church might look like that is winsome, that engages people where they are, and that aligns with Jesus' other-centered, co-suffering way. What could church look like in the culture we find ourselves in today? What would it take for church to matter to people who aren't deep on the inside? Now, these ideas are not about doctrine, at least not on the surface. They're about practice. But make no mistake, our practice, our church structures, the way we do things, these all grow out of our beliefs and principles. So see if some of these ideas resonate with you. The church of the future needs to let go of operating by force and power and instead choose a way that is marked by love and consent. This church would do less 
who would be less driven to produce programs and instead spend more time listening, listening to God, listening to its members and participants, and listening to the world around it. This church would be willing to be honest about the past, willing to admit when it's done harm or contributed to harm, and most importantly, would rush toward making things right rather than rushing to circle the wagons to protect an image or an institution or a leader. This church would feel less like it's trying to build a new cool kids table, instead opting for radical and generous inclusivity. This church would focus less on building big crowds where many people listen to the voices of a few and opt for nurturing smaller community spaces where everyone's voice can be heard. The expectation would be that God speaks through the community, not just through a couple elevated leaders. This church would double down on loving service, letting go of programs and outreach that come with strings attached or some expectation of conversion or contribution. This church would set aside rigid purity culture, where people's value and even their ability to participate is measured on some scale of proper behavior or even uniform belief, choosing instead a path of generous welcome where nuance is expected and people don't have to hide who they are. This church would let go of its addiction to looking like the latest, biggest, famous, franchised expression of Christianity and instead prefer local in particular following the Spirit into authentic manifestations of community, more food cart, less chain restaurant. This church would set aside the model of religious content programming and move toward being a practical school of love. At the end of our conversation, Kevin talked about an incredible possibility. A church like this would make such a positive difference in the community that even the people who don't go there would be glad it's in the neighborhood because it makes the neighborhood better for everybody. That's a vision that moves me. Does it move you? If it does, understand that this vision comes with a homework assignment. That assignment, if you and I wish that church was more like what I just described, then you and I have to consider what we might do to bring that about. How will we serve? What kind of leaders will we support? Are we willing to be less comfortable as the church becomes less about us and our preferences? Will we invest time and heart and even cash in churches that look like this? The way God seems to have chosen to do things in our world means that God's work in the world happens only as people respond to the nudge of the Holy Spirit. And that, that means you and me getting involved. May you see your role in bringing this kind of vibrant church community to life. And may all of us have the courage to follow Jesus into this kind of other-centered, co-suffering community. Thanks for listening. Notes for today's episode and any links mentioned can be found at www.markallenshelsky.com forward slash TAW049. There you'll find Kevin's website, a link to his book, Why Would Anyone Go to Church, and links to some of his other creative work, some short films on being human, and a 60-minute one-man show called Holy Shift. If you found today's conversation helpful, then subscribe to my email list. I usually email about once a month. This amazing email includes links to my writing, the next podcast episode, books I recommend for your spiritual journey, and a little bit of a catch up with what's going on with me in my life. Opt in and you'll get a free little book called The Anchor Prayer, a prayer and practice for remaining grounded in a chaotic world. That sounds useful, doesn't it? This short read will teach you a spiritual practice that has been so helpful to me as I have faced the anxiety and uncertainty of our time. Subscribe, get that book, at www.markoptin.com. Until next time, remember, in this one present moment, you are loved, you are known, and you are not alone.